and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to uh, talk at, at this uh, mathematical summer, summer school in Paris. So most of you have probably heard of Escher and probably most of you like his works. It's interesting because he's an artist and he's rarely seen in the Museum of Foreign Arts around the world. I guess the reason why it's, it's so, it's because uh, his art pieces talks to mathematically bent minds, probably like yours and mine. That brings also uh, another question of, of mine, something that I play when I'm bored or I feel alone, is when uh, mathematics was first, uh, first appeared on the planet. Same question could uh, be asked about medicine or uh, literature. So I guess medicine was uh, really close to witchcraft and uh, people realized that some herbs had an effect on the body. And uh, literature was probably uh, appear appeared first uh, around a fire when the clan or a, a tribe would discuss the, the the hunts of uh, previous generations and things that would strike their imagination. So what was the first uh, appearance on the planet of uh, mathematics? Probably most of you will think about arithmetic, but I think mathematics must have uh, appeared way before. So I'd like to show you some tilings. Uh, they are quite striking. And uh, Escher was also very, very uh, puzzled, intrigued, and uh, found these tilings really, uh, as you can read, it, it remains an extremely absorbing activity, a real mania to which I've become addicted and from which I sometimes find it hard to tear myself away. So these lines were written while he was. Uh, visiting the Alhambra in the south of uh, Spain. And we'll see one of the tiling that he was uh, admiring there. So uh, here's uh, a first tiling. I find it remarkable. It's on a mammoth tusk, and it's uh, about more than 10,000 year old. So it's striking because the engraver, the he or the she who did the engraving, use hexagons. So this person was quite gifted in mathematics because actually there's only three uh, regular polygons that can be used to tile big surfaces. It can be a square, it can be a triangle, and the hexagon. The hexagon is by far the most difficult to draw. I ask you, uh, I'll challenge you to draw about 10 of them really uh, close to one another. You'll see it's very difficult, but here they are. Um, so this person 12,000 years ago already showed uh, an interesting mathematical mind. The uh, tiling appeared probably almost in several other parts of the planet. Here is a temple from Uru. A uh, city that is, has now disappeared. It's in the nowadays Iraq. And you see clearly the pattern, even though it's on cylinders, it seems like columns, but you can see it quite nicely. The next one is not really a tiling in the proper sense, mathematical sense, in the sense that it doesn't fill a plane or a surface, but it's, um, it's used a different mosaic. Uh, using many, many regular polygons. So it's striking and I wanted to, to show it to you. The last one is some uh, tiling that I'm pretty sure Escher saw when he was there in Alhambra. Let me take a few uh, seconds to describe it. Focus first on this diagonal of blue pattern. They look almost triangular except with curvy sides. And each of them has an hexagon within this quote-unquote triangle. The same pattern appears on the green diagonal, the black, 
the reddish, yellow, orange one, and so on. Between the colored columns, the diagonals, you also have a pattern with white triangle and inside a star. So instead of a pen pentagon, the, per the person who did this engraving or tiling decided to put stars instead of a hexagon in the white triangle. It's pretty um, amazing. It's nice. And it's an interplay of the color triangle with the white one, which is quite striking. OK, so let's try to be a little more serious, quote unquote. And I'll play like uh, artist in chief in the Alhambra. So this tiling was my creation. It's kind of cute, if I can say so myself. It's built out of uh, colored uh, triangles and white ones. So it has many, many properties. Um, you will see, for example, that uh, it can be moved without changing. So look at this point and this point. And I can move it smoothly all the way so that it gets back to exactly its position. So nothing has changed after this translation, this move. All lines were preserved, all triangles were preserved. And after this small translation, the thing hasn't changed at all. I can also rotate it, for example, around this point, as you can see now. It might be a little uh, choppy, a rotation, but in the, in the long run, it will take back its position exactly as it was before. So there's a natural um, object related to a tiling. It's the action that I can take to move the pattern and to bring it back to not its original position, but a different position that mimics exactly what I was seeing before translating and rotating. I'm going to ask you to uh, be, I mean, there's quite a bit of participants. I'm delighted that you're there. So I'm going to play a game. Uh, you'll, you'll be asked to answer the question through a questionnaire that uh, Daniel will pop up. And the question is, suppose that I'm a fabricant. I, I, I have an industry and I do tiles so that can people can tile their uh, bathroom floor or their kitchen walls or whatever. My concern is that uh, it's, I think it's more intelligent to have the smallest tile possible. So I'll be uh, shipping smaller boxes. If the, the contractor breaks one, it won't break a big uh, tile and so on and so forth. So I'm going to ask you what of the tile A, B, C, or D would be the smallest that can be used to tile my whole floor. It's easy to see um, because uh, look first at the big hexagon. It has exactly six tiles, and uh, it's all obtained by rotating this one. And then I can move the, the hexagon everywhere. I can see this little flower with six uh, blue dots. I can move it here, move it here, and here and so on, and it clearly fills the whole thing. Okay, good. We'll play the game again. It's kind of fun. Before moving, I would like to have a volunteer ask, uh, answer me a few questions very easy. Uh, I would like you to raise your hand. Can you give me uh, the, the degree or the size of the angle of the colored triangle? So, for example, what's the angle here? That's 90 degree angle. Very Seems good. So. Yes, it is. What about this one? Well, it seems like a 30 degree angle, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, there. there's exactly six angles here. Oh, OK, sorry. So it would be? Yeah. So what? Uh, six degrees. 
Same day. Very good. Yeah. Finally, what about this one? Yeah, that's 30. 30. Okay. 30 plus 60 plus 90. That's 180. Thank you, Dren. Uh, I'll I'll use you as a as a volunteer uh, in the slides coming. Thank you very much for the time being. But stay alive. I'll I'll come back to you. Okay. So we've played our game. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the first concept that uh, has appeared, and it took a long time for mathematicians to figure out these action on some object that was playing a key role in mathematics. We've seen on tiling that I can move the tiling and leave it invariant, but uh, the real uh, emergence of the concept as a very good, powerful object in mathematics took about, well, several thousands of years. And it turned, it came about in a very abstract way. First through work of Lagrange uh, when he was studying um, polynomials or functions of no, uh, many variables and exchanging the variables. And Galois used the same idea, but uh, to exchange roots of polynomials. And I think uh, Galois was, um, had a stroke of genius because he would manage to think of the group not as the tiling that is being moved, but only of the action. So I'm flashing the definition of a group and the action of a group that due to Galois, it's two separate concepts. Uh, if you haven't seen them, don't worry, it's not that important because I'm not going to work uh, a lot with them. But um, it's only to uh, underline the fact that even though tiling has been around essentially for 10,000 years, it took mathematicians quite a bit of time to realize that it was super useful. So let me try to do the, the mathematics. Uh, of the tiling or the group acting on the tiling. So the movement that I've described, the translation and the rotation can be captured in an affine transformation. It's a very particular affine transformation because it, it, it uses an orthogonal matrix. So how does it work? The point in the plane is X. I multiply it by the matrix R, two by two, and then add a vector, a two by two vector that acts as the translation. So that's a little bit complicated because it involves an orthogonal matrix that represents either a reflection or a, a rotation, followed by translation. I'm going to give two examples. The first one is the simple case where the rotation is actually the identity matrix, so it doesn't ro rotate at all. It's only a movement like the, my first uh, choppy animation that moved the point X to the point X plus T. And in coordinates, you see how it goes. And then there's a second example where actually the translation is set to zero and I'm only rotating by the angle theta. So for those who have done a little bit of linear algebra, uh, you see this matrix is a rotation counterclockwise by an angle of theta. You see also on this uh, drawing that I can rotate uh, 180 degree on this, around this point. And indeed, I will leave the tiling invariant. I will rotate around here by 60 degree, and again, I'll leave the pattern invariant and 120 around here. I can move also, bring the, the blue flower, so to speak, to the neighboring one here, or upward vertically to this one here. So there's quite a bit of action, and of course, there's only a few that I've, I've shown here because I could rotate around here or around here, and so on and so forth. The representation here is always a rotation around the, the origin. So if this is the origin, it won't tell me how to rotate around this place 
or this place or any other place where I can rotate. And I'll show you the trick to do so in a few slides. So only for people who have heard about groups, um, I can compose, like I compose function in calculus or even in high school, and choose two uh, mapping, one with the rotation matrix R and the tra translation T, and then do again another uh, affine transformation labeled by a orthogonal matrix Q and the vector S. When I did do explicitly on that, it will be an ex easy exercise uh, in my list. You get this transformation. The rotation talks to each other only and separately, but the translation get a, an effect on the second matrix Q, so it's not totally trivial. Usually, real mathematicians say, hey, the letter F is totally useless. I'll, give, I'll just drop it and I'll define the multiplication or the composition of my groups, group elements as being defined that way. Again, if you haven't done groups, not too bad because uh, there's quite a bit to enjoy in the coming slides. Okay, so how do I rotate? Um, uh, uh, around a point that's not the origin. The trick is interesting, it's simple, but curiously, it's a trick that's used everywhere in mathematics, not only in Thailand. So let me first uh, look at what I want to achieve. I'd like to rotate around this point, which is not the origin, which I've taken the origin here. And I'm going to rotate by 90 degree. So if I look at the end screenshot, I like to bring the tie link like here. It won't bring back the tie link to what it was. This is only to depict how am I going to do the uh, rotation around a point that's not the origin. So what I do is I first translate the point I want to rotate around to the origin, and I bring it back here. Then I do the rotation, say about 90 degree. That's what I get here. And finally, I translate back the point that was supposed to be rotated around at its final position or its original position also by the inverse translation. So, I have achieved exactly what I wanted to do, to rotate by a 90 degree angle counterclockwise the, the drawing around this point. So in terms of uh, my very compact notation, translation by minus the point to bring back the point to the origin, rotation, and push back the origin to the original position. It's curious that this uh, manipulation, which uh, sandwiched this rotation with uh, a certain element in its inverse, plays such an important role in mathematics. Actually, it's so important that it's, uh, bear, it bears a name. We call it a conjugation. So here's a, a conjugation of a general element QS by an element RT. So RT and its inverse are, gi are given that specific form. And if I use my um, formula that I've given, well, the expression of the conjugation is quite something, not too difficult to work, to work out, but uh, here it is. And for people who have uh, learned about group theory, just a very quick question that I'll leave you. I'll, I'll give you the answer right away. But there's two very natural subgroup, the group of rotation where I never do a translation. All the elements of this subgroup has its their translation set to zero. And the other subgroup where all the rotation matrix are set to identity. 
So if I compose two translation, I'll get a translation in this subgroup. We need the first one. If I compose two rotation around the origin, I'll also get the rotation around the origin. So there's an important war in group theory that's called normal. And, uh, only one of these two is normal, and it's the translation. So end of group theory, we're moving to something else, except that we'll play a last time the game of the tiling. Why? Because, uh, well, it's kind of fun, and it also has the, the advantage to play with uh, the drawings of Escher. So that's one of his famous, the salamanders or the lizards uh, drawing. It's quite striking, it's beautiful, it's intricate. You can look at it and see how, how wise this guy was. But hey, I'm, I'm, I want to play the, the game of the smallest tile again. So I'll give you 15 seconds again to decide which of the three tiles, A, B, and C, would be the smallest possible if I want to tile a large surface, like a bathroom floor, for example, and I want to have the pattern of white, red, and black uh, salamanders, lizards. Okay, so the, the right answer is actually C. It's a little tricky, actually. I think we can get rid of A quickly because it doesn't have the, the head of a black salamander lizard. So this one would be too small. This one has actually a full uh, head of the white. For example, this part is missing, but reappears here. It has a full red, a full red, uh, black head, but actually there's limbs missing. For example, the black lizard doesn't get its uh, left or right uh, back in limb, but it does here because even though they're cut from the top of the triangle, they reappeared in the bottom. So you can play, but the right answer is C. And congratulations to for those who voted for C, but also it was a uh, thank you for participating in the game. I'm changing the topics now. I want to uh, talk to you about axioms, but um, you'll see it, play, it will play a role even in the tiling. That's a little weird, but let's move. Uh, I'll ask you again to participate and raise your hand. Danielle, you'll have to help me to decide uh, who wants to participate, but here are three copies of the same book one in Old Greek, one in Latin, and one in Arabic. Would you be able to guess what is the book in question? So if you want to uh, try to guess, raise your hand, and Daniel will uh, allow you to uh, open your, um, your microphone. 10 seconds for a brave person. It's interesting because you, you look at the dates and you see that actually uh, it moved, uh, it got translated in various uh, ways. And uh, even though the Arabic document is from 1108, they had a, a version before that, before it was translated to uh, uh, Latin. So I'm going to impress you by reading one sentence of Latin. I don't know Latin, so I should be careful. But I know that honest means all. Rectus angulus looks awfully like right angle. There's a word I have no clue what it is, but the last word is equalis, which means like equal. So that's the third axiom by a uh, fourth axiom, I think, by uh, Euclid. And uh, a small uh, historical note to uh, notice that uh, Gutenberg uh, in the Occident uh, invented the, the 
the printing by uh, Fons, and it was around 1455. So in a very Christian Germany, he didn't have much choice to print the first book or to choose his first book, first book to be the Bible. But what's striking is that the, about 20 years ago, people started to print books and uh, Erhard Radolt decided to uh, choose among all the books he could print the elements of Euclid as something that probably uh, civilization, civilization needed to have as a printed book. So I kind of like uh, this uh, this choice of Herr Radon. Okay, so why do I want to talk about the Euclid, uh, Euclid elements? Because they're incredibly modern in, the, in their way of uh, being presented. The first two pages contains uh, definitions, common notions, and axioms. So let's start by the easiest, the common, the common notion. Uh, things which are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. So if equal A is equal to Z and B is equal to Z, then A is equal to B. If A equals B added to equals, well, the, the results will be equal, things like that. So these common notions are so obvious that, well, okay, you're, you're doing a good job. It, puts everybody on the same level, thank you. The definitions are a little tougher. I'll start by number 10 because uh, it's, it, this one is clear to me. So uh, it really talks about two straight lines that intersect. When a straight line set up on the straight lines make the adjacent angle equal to one another, Though the two angles that uh, are touching through uh, the one of the uh, line, if they are equal, well, they'll be called right angle, and the two straight lines will be called perpendicular. So that's what we've learned in high school. We're pleased with that. I'd like now to um, point out number one and four, which are a lot more difficult. So a point is that which has no part. Okay, um, I've been taught that in high school, never really understood what it meant, but is that an atom or something like that? Okay, and definition number four, you see it's really tough. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. What does it mean exactly? Of course, we've done Euclidean geometry in high school. So we know what is a straight line, but mm, the definition itself is a little bizarre. I put the French uh, definitions uh, in the bottom. If you don't read French, don't worry. Is that I did that only to pinpoint and underline the fact that in all language, the definition for is kind of weird. Okay. So I'm going to stop complaining about Euclid's uh, monument, and I'll go to the axiom. They're kind, of, they're well known, but I'm going to uh, read them because they're simple, they're clear. At least the first four. Okay, the first one says, "You give me two points, I can draw a line that goes through the two points." So there's a segment of line joining the two points. The second one says that I can extend this straight line passing through the two points indefinitely on either side of the line, or either side of the points. Third one says that you give me a point and a length or distance, and I can draw a circle whose center is the point you gave in me, and the radius is the length you gave me. The fourth is the one that I was able to read in the Latin document, all right angles are equal. And the fifth one is long and tough. So realize, I should like to uh, remark that the 
first, the first four are one line, and the fifth one is actually so long, it takes as much space as the first four to arrive. I've even decided to, uh, to draw a picture of the construction so that everybody will be able to see uh, what it means. We're talking about three lines now, two blue and a red one. So if a straight line, the red one, has two straight line blue intersecting it in such a way that these two angles, the interior angles, sum up to less than two right angles, then the two blue lines will intersect on the same side as the two interior angles. That's quite a mouthful, actually. It's tough, it's long. And uh, at least there's good news because there's another way to formulate the same axiom. Or to be more precise, to formulate an axiom that can replace the, the one I've just described without changing anything. Okay, so here's five prime. In a plane, give a line D. Point A outside D, then there will be at most one parallel line to the given line uh, can be drawn through the point A without intersecting D. Though it's, uh, there's only at most one of such parallel lines. So what does it mean exactly that it's equivalent to the, fur, the number five that I described in the previous slide? It means the following one. So it's a little uh, logically tricky. Oh, bear attention. So if I use the four first with the number five that I was in the that I used in the previous slide, I can prove five prime as a consequence of these five axioms. Similarly, if I use the four first and five prime, I can prove, deduce the five, the first version of five that I've described before. So in a certain sense, I can use either number five or five prime to construct the same theory. The theory would be identical and the number five that I uh, didn't use will be a consequence of the number five that I chose. Okay, so did Euclid know about the sphere? That sounds a weird question, but I like to uh, ask uh, the question because it makes you realize a lot of things. First, um, the the definition I was complaining about, a straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself, is, is a little weird. When I'm talking about the geometry of the sphere, I don't want to talk about the point inside the sphere or outside the sphere. I want to talk only about the point on the surface. So imagine uh, an orange, I would only allow myself to move along the skin of the orange and not go where the, the pulp and the, the juice is, nor go outside the skin. So if I want to go from Montreal to Yaoundé, I'm not going to be allowed to, for example, pierce a tunnel, which would be a straight line between Montreal and Yaoundé. I would have to draw something on the skin of the, the sphere. And of course, if I want to go quickly, I'll use a straight line, which is not a straight line, or maybe it's a straight line with the definition of Euclid, but I would propose something slightly different. And I would propose the shortest path between two points. So here's the bizarre fact the, that the, the shortest pass between the uh, two points on the sphere happens on great circle. The great circles are the largest circle on the sphere. For example, the equator is a, that, that I've drawn here 
is a great circle. Any meridian going through the pole, North Pole would be a great circle. And the one that I've drawn through Montreal and Yaoundé is also a great, a great circle. And the shortest path is really this segment of spherical line on, uh, on the great circle. Notice that here is a smaller circle going through the two points. And if I would have the fancy to visit this line, it wouldn't be longer than using this thing. So um, let's face it, we mathematicians communicate with our mother tongue or English, if we've learned English. In any case, we'll always use human language. And if we're blind, we'll use braille or uh, if we are deaf, we're going to use sing sign, uh, sign, uh, signs to communicate. But in all the things we do, we use a language that is below or above mathematics and will face the same problem. So you're right to point that it would be nice to get rid of all definitions, but uh, then it would be very difficult to communicate. And mathematicians try to make their definition as, as precise as possible. And um, I will challenge you to make better than Euclid in its uh, definition of the straight line. It's, it's, uh, I said it, it, it puzzled, me, puzzled me as not a very good definition. But I didn't say that I was uh, able to do better. In the case of the spherical geometry, I use a definition that I know is the usual one. It works, but uh, uh, if I would have been writing the elements, that would have been very difficult. Okay, let me go on. But that's a very good question, and it's a limitation, let's face it, of mathematics. We need human language to communicate. Okay, postulates. Which one survive? Well, if I have two points on the uh, on the sphere, it's always possible to draw great circles through them. And yes, this is a, always possible. Is it possible to make it infinite in both directions? No, it doesn't actually. And that axioms fail. Can I describe a circle with any center or any distance? Well, no, if the radius is larger than the radius of the sphere. All right angles are equal. Yes, that's easy. Or actually, I haven't defined how to measure right angles on the sphere, but um, intuitively, I would measure them as the angle that's formed by two great circles, for example, intersecting on a point, and I would measure them with my Euclidean planar uh, geometry. In a plane given D and a point A, not on it, at most one line parallel to the given line can be drawn to the point. I actually voted against because for the, uh, the following reason, if I take, for example, the equator as the line D and the North Pole as the point, I'll notice that there's, uh, an in, there's no line or great circle going through the North Pole that is parallel to the equator. Yesterday, I'm in reading or in being more careful, the, the axiom says at most one line parallel. So there could be none, and the axiom would still be um, respected. So I guess this axiom should have a thumbs up, not a thumbs down, because on the sphere, it is impossible to draw a, a line parallel to the equator uh, passing by a point outside the, the equator. But 
to be sure, uh, these axioms are all not uh, respected. And I cannot assume that uh, everything that's uh, deduced from the axiom, the five axioms, will still hold. So, did Euclid know about spherical geometry? I'm pretty sure he did. So, how did he came up with the fifth axiom? And how did he realize that he needed it uh, really? For me, it's a, I think it's a stroke of genius. And many uh, mathematicians think that Euclid is the greatest non-Euclidean geometer because he realized that he needed the fifth, the fifth postulate. Again, now that I have a straight line, I have segments of straight line, so I should be able to do triangles. So I'm sorry, I think it's silly to have these fireworks, but I kind of like them. And I could do tiles. Wow, that's an interesting thing. And here's a beautiful one. Well, I did it myself, so I, I shouldn't say it's beautiful, but it's kind of nice. Okay, so again, color triangles. I replace the white triangles by the absence of white triangles. So I can go, I can see in the back also. And uh, every triangle is similar to the other. And um, is my friend, Dren, are you still there, Dren? Could you open your microphone? Maybe Dren is not there anymore. Stefan, are you okay. there? Oh, Dren is here. Good, 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 good. Thank you to be back. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to ask you also to uh, to measure the size of the angles, and uh, I'll help you a little bit. For example, around this point, the five angle, the six angle. For example, this one, this one, this one four, five, six, they're all the same angles. So what are the angles, the blue angle here? Well, uh, it should be 60, I think, but since we're not even playing, we're in a sphere, it should be greater, maybe? No, it, it, uh, I'll, I'll, no, it will be 60. So that's a good question, how to measure uh, angle on the sphere. Actually, they should be measured uh, with your Euclidean eyes. So okay. we would need a little bit more to define it properly on the tangent plane, but uh, your computation was the exact, it's 16 D. So let's move to the other one, the one here, where again, it's not as clear, but six uh, triangles similar um, meet at this point here. So this one would be what the measure? Mm, I believe 60 again. Maybe. Very good. And finally, this one. Okay. Uh, I see you used a different shape, a circle there. So I'm a little bit confused, but I believe 60 should be fine there too. Actually, there's four angles that are identical meeting here. One, two, three, four. And they're all equal. Oh, yes, so it would be. Fun. You're puzzled, right? 90. No, no, 90 degrees. 90. I'm sorry. My brain is fried. No. I apologize. No, 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 no problem. Um, <laughs> there's a little frightening to uh, realize that 90 plus 60 plus 60 doesn't give you the 180. But uh, we didn't respect all the axiom of Euclidean geometry. So actually, we uh, have to give, uh, to give up some of the result of Euclidean geometry. And actually, I could ask the question, is the sum of three interior angles of a spherical triangle is always larger than pi or 180 degree. Actually, it is. So then, thank you again. I'll use your services soon again, but uh, let's move back to the main presentation.
in my flash. I'm going to uh, introduce now yet another geometry. So um, it's been in, in the cooking for a long while. So it's kind of interesting uh, to do a little bit of history again. Um, here's the title of my side, slide. The fifth postulate is the ugliest thing ever. So this is not my statement. I, I do respect Euclid uh, a lot more than this would uh, uh, suggest. The fact is that uh, the fifth postulate is not the favorite of, of the five postulates. First is awkward, is long, is bizarre, and a Greek of the name of Proclus really caught the, the, the feeling of the, the, the epoch of his time by saying, it is clear that we must look for proof of this theorem that does not have the character of a postulate. So for Proclus, this thing is surely not a postulate, and it should be uh, deduced from the four first axioms. It's clear that it has the taste of a theorem, not uh, a postulate. A lot of people believed in his uh, judgment, and actually, uh, for a long time, people tried to prove the thing, to pr prove that the fifth postulate, either version, is actually a following from the first four axioms. I told you that uh, the uh, Arabic world was quick to get the translation of uh, Euclid's elements, and uh, the brightest mind there was quick to replace the Greek efforts by either uh, Arabic one or Persian one. Uh, they were quite a brilliant mind there working to get a proof. During that period of time, uh, Europe was pretty much sleeping as much as the science goes, but the re Renaissance came uh, and hit um, Europe, and of course the uh, Italian, uh, I mean, think about Galileo Galilei, but also great mind uh, Italian tried to uh, prove the fifth axiom, and Johann Lambert, the German, made the big effort and probably culminated in Adrien Marie Legendre. Legendre must be called Mr. Parallelism. Actually, he devoted a great part of his life trying to prove the fifth axiom, and actually he did uh, write several proofs of them, and they were all wrong. So why would I bother to um, underline his feet? It's because he was always the one finding the error on his proof. You know, his proofs. It, it's, it's quite striking because uh, you might not have written many proofs yet, but it's really hard to uh, find the error in one's proofs. So the fact that Legend was able to uh, uh, find such uh, such errors, he is a strikingly brilliant mathematician. So this 200 uh, 2000 year efforts uh, went to a halt when two uh, mathematicians independently constructed a geometry that respects the first four but contradicts the fifth showing then that you can have a geometry where the first four are respected, but not the fifth, and then the fifth cannot be following from the first four. Many, many math mathematicians worked on making clear this statement. And actually, I'm going to present a version due to Henri Poincaré. I kind of like his presentation because it's a little Machiavellic in the sense that it uses only Euclidean geometry to, con to construct a geometry that's not Euclidean. So the trick is really Machiavellic because if you find an error in this new geometry, it brings down also the Euclidean geometry. Uh, 
And that's a very good question. Thank you for it. And I'm not going to answer it because it's part of the exercises. So actually, um, it's not always 210, 210. But uh, the exercise in my notes uh, that you have online uh, push you to uh, think a little bit more about it. Very, very good question. Uh, other question, Daniel? I move on. I move on. Okay, good. It's fun. Hey, good question, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so here's a presentation of a new geometry that I'm going to call hyperbolic. The whole universe is inside this circle. The horizon is not part of the universe. It's just drawn to help the eye because everything happens within the horizon. Well, uh, when I asked Ron a few minutes ago to compute the angles on the sphere, he hesitated. So for the same reason, I'm going to say that the angles are measured with Euclidean geometry eyes. So if you see a 60 degree angle, it will be 60 degree. The straight lines are very peculiar. So they look like that. Every diameter, so every line passing through the center of the disk will be a line. But there will be many other Every arc of a circle that intersects the horizon at right angle will be also a line. I'll use sometimes hyperbolic line, but most of the time I will drop the adjective hyperbolic. But uh, I'm defining what is a hyperbolic line and what I mean by two circles intersecting at right angle is by if I draw the tangent line to both at the intersection point, these two lines will be right angle. The distance are not Euclidean. So the angles are what you see, but the distance are not. Actually, all the lines drawn here are infinite of length. And the fact is that a little segment here of a given length will be a lot shorter to the same length appearing in with your Euclidean eye here. So as I go from the center of the disk I, and I go at, at constant speed, I will have to slow down, slow down, slow down because I'm traveling a longer distance with on the hyperbolic uh, Poincaré disk. So we'll go to um, our usual exercise and ask which of the axioms survive. Okay, so let's two point be given. Am I always able to find a hyperbolic line between these two points? The answer is yes. And it's a totally Euclidean geometry to find a circle that intersects the horizon at right angle and goes through these two points. And actually, because this arc, which intersects the horizon at right angle, is infinite of length, the second axiom is also respected. What about circle? Well, here is a bunch. In fact, the distance between the, the center and the first circle is equal to the distance between the first circle and the second, the second and the third, and so on and so forth. Of course, I could have carried on to draw an infinite amount of circle, but I've stopped after a few. You'll probably ask, hey, 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 that's not any center. You're right. So here's a bunch which do not have the same center. And you start having a feeling of this hyperbolic geometry. Why? 
because the yellow dot here is actually the center of all these yellow circles. For example, this the distance from here to the origin, to uh, I'm sorry, to the center here is the same as the distance from here to here. So this segment is closer to the horizon than the distance, than the uh, limiting point here. So it makes sense that the center of the circle is closer to this than to this. So actually, indeed, the fourth axiom is respected. What about the fifth? Well, the fifth needs a little bit more thinking. So let's get to the next slide. OK, so I remind you the fifth prime of Euclidean geometry of the plane. Given a line D and a point A, there's at most one line parallel to the given line uh, can be drawn through the point. So there's at most one parallel line going through A. And what is parallel is that these, the line through A doesn't intersect D. Well, in this case, this uh, first, this uh, Euclidean axiom is uh, destroyed in the most dramatic way because not only there's two of these lines, but all the lines that I've drawn through A are parallel to D. And since you all uh, love mathematics, I guess you can easily imagine that I could draw another circle intersecting the horizon, intersecting the horizon at right angle. In many, in many others, and actually, there's an infinite amount of hyperbolic lines going through A that are parallel to D. So in this geometry, the fifth axiom is not uh, true. And here's an example of a rather simple geometry that um, really ruined 2,000 years of efforts to prove the fifth axiom. OK. Oh, I promise you to stop uh, using the fireworks, but I'm afraid that I'll use them uh, another time. There are lines. There are triangles. There should be tiling. OK. So in the remaining time, I'm going to draw a tiling in the hyperbolic uh, plane. There are circle, uh, oops, okay, let me come back to the drawing there. The yellow uh, circle are Euclidean circles, so you see them as circle, they are not ellipses, but their center is not the Euclidean center. So, Again, for example, the large yellow circle here has this center as its hyperbolic center. But each of the circles you see, the brown and the, uh, the yellow, are both Euclidean and hyperbolic circles, but with different centers. Did I understand properly? Uh, did I answer properly the question? Is it clear? It's really, be really bizarre. They are Euclidean center, but it's not the reason why they respect the four, uh, the third axiom. The third axiom is that they are hyperbolic uh, circles. Okay, let's move back to my firework. Okay, here I'm going to start drawing, drawing a tile. I need to be careful because triangles are three uh, points, three vertices, joined by segments of line. So I'll please save for two segments of line. I'm going to use diameters. So obviously they are um, 
there are lines, hyperbolic lines. So the segment AB and AB prime are segments of a triangle. I, I'm happy. For the third uh, side, I'm going to use uh, this uh, hyperbolic line that intersect the horizon at right angles. So my little uh, drawing here is a uh, hyperbolic. The next step of the tiling is kind of simple because I'm going to rotate the original triangle by uh, 90 degrees. The diameters of this one will be become the diameter of this one, for example. They are still hyperbolic line, and I can easily imagine that the arc of a circle that intersected the horizon at the right angles will be sent to another arc here intersecting the horizon at right angles. So, so these four drawings that you're seeing are obviously uh, hyperbolic triangle. Next step, I was trying to imagine simply rotating the thing, but this is a very bad idea because this shape here is surely not a triangle because this thing is not the segment of a hyperbolic line. I know the hyperbolic line would look like uh, an arc of a circle, so this is bad. I'll need uh, a, a, an idea to move on. And it's a tough idea, so let me take a break and uh, relax a little bit to tell you a story about uh, 1954. None of us were uh, already born, but mathematics already existed, and uh, the, the event takes place in Amsterdam at the ICM, the International Congress of Mathematicians. The meeting is between two stars. I'll let you uh, guess who they are, but it will be pretty obvious. One is an artist, and he talks to the other one, the other one who is a mathematician, and he tells him that he has a really artistic project, that of representing the infinity in an art piece. It can happen that someone, not having assimilated much of the knowledge of from previous generations, it can happen indeed that this someone might feel one day the desire, strong and conscious, to approach infinity as purely and closely as possible. The artist goes on in explaining that actually he has found a way to represent the infinity in a single point in his drawing, but he wanted instead to the infinity to be the outside, not the center of his uh, etching. So the mathematician told you, oh, you want the infinity to be out. I know how to do it. And of course, the artist said, oh, would you explain to me how to do that? So the two stars are obviously Mauritius Escher and less obviously uh, Harold Coxeter, who's a British, uh, he was British born, but did most of his career at the University of Toronto in Canada, who explained uh, the basic rules of drawing hyperbolic lines to Escher. So, Here's a, one of the constructions that Coxeter explained to uh, Escher. It's, uh, I call it the Euclidean inversion, even though it's be, it has been discovered or invented by Ludwig Magnus kind of 2,000 years after Euclidean. Euclid. I call it Euclidean because actually it's a rule and compass construction only. It's absolutely beautiful, and you require a circle of center O, and you're going to construct the inversion of P through this circle. How is the inversion of P through the circle defined? It's defined that way. The inversion of P with respect to the circle is another point P prime, drawn here, but I'll tell you how to construct it. 
on the half line from O to P, such that the length of OP divided by the radius of the circle is equal to the radius of the circle divided by OP prime. Okay, it sounds tough, but it's rather simple. I use a compass and put the dry uh, tip here and the pencil of the compass here. And I draw the arc of the circle of, going, of center P and radius the distance OP. Of course, the circle will hit the circle, the inverted circle at two points. There and here, I choose Q and draw the line QP and OP. Since OP and QP are the radius of the same circle, these two uh, segments are the same length and they, find, they define an isosceles triangle OPQ. I put back the dry pin of my compass at Q and use the radius of the inversion circle to draw the yellow circle or arc of the circle. Of course, it hits at one point the line through OP, and I'll call the point P prime. Again, because I've used the compass, the length of OQ and QP prime are the same. So OP prime Q is an isosceles triangle, and it shares this angle with the first isosceles OPQ that I have drawn. So these two triangles are similar, and the large length side of the first triangle divided by its small length will be equal to the, small, the long length of the small triangle divided by the small length OP of this triangle. So here's a purely Euclidean geometry construction, and it respects all uh, the, the requirement of this formula. The inversion is pretty striking. It has the following property. First, the points on the inversion circle are their own inversion. So actually, their own image under the inversion. The inversion transforms circle into circle. For example, this large circle here is sent in the small circle here. So it's not obvious that when you compute the inversion of all the points here, you'll end up in a circle, but you can show it. The image of the blue circle is the little reddish circle here. And notice that I, the intersect here almost at right angle, the same angle that you see here between the intersection of the two small image of the inversion. So I'm going back to my tiling, and I'm going to use this idea to construct new triangles. At this point, I have only four. Okay. Here, a scary image, so I, it requires a little bit of explaining. I've drawn the two diameters that are the original uh, hyperbolic line that define the, the side of my first triangle, and also the other, the last hyperbolic line for the last triangle. I've done the same thing for the other three triangles, and I've even colored the one for this triangle. I'm going to invert all these lines through this circle here. It's a little tough. The drawing is quite busy, so follow the guide. I'm going to think first about what becomes the horizon when I invert it through this uh, arc of the circle. Well, I just said that the inversion of a circle, for example, the horizon, will remain a, a circle. Moreover, the 
point here of the horizon will stay where it is. Same with the point here. Moreover, the image of the horizon through the inversion will need to meet this arc at right angle. If you follow uh, with attention this argument, you'll be convinced actually that the horizon remains the same through the inversion here. I've also drawn with the same color the inversion of this line, the point within the uh, intersecting the in inversion circle remains here, but this bar is sent here, and this bar is sent here. Oh, sorry, 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 that's wrong. This part is sent here, and this part is sent here. Same thing with the diameter, green, it's sent here, and the blue diameter is sent here. So actually, the triangle here is sent within this white triangle here, and this triangle is the image to the inversion of this triangle here. So I'm going to use this idea to go on uh, with my tiling. I've alternated white and colored, white and color, and so on around here. I'll do the same and replicating only the small uh, drawing that you see in the next one. But I'm going to paint this white, 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 and colored, 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 colored. Fix this point, I'm going to clean up and show you the new tiling. So these four triangles are the image through the inversion of these four. Of course, I've added these uh, drawing all around. And with this idea, I can move on and do a full tiling as here, as you show here. There's a little bit of white because at one point I became a little lazy, but there's an infinity of triangles that are hidden in the white stuff here. Okay, so yeah. same, same thing. The uh, the angle at the vertex are all the same. So the color one, white color, white color, white color, white. They're all eight angles identical. Actually, this angle is 90 degree. So the red dot is how many degree? Mm, so we have 90 degree or K. So red dot would be Hmm. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure I've, I've been away since e 50 I've done a lot of math. I just can't. I don't know. I don't know what's happening to me. Okay, 90 degree divided by four. Two is 45. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. here you see the pattern. Uh, for the green one and the blue one is also our pattern where six identical angles, angles or more precisely, six similar angles meet. So we do have the 360 divided by six. It's again, six times 60. So these are 60, 60 and 45. And we do get 120 plus 45, 165, and it's less than the 180. So thank you, Diane. I, I need to uh, underline the fact that, again, this geometry doesn't respect the axiom of planar Euclidean geometry. So the sum is smaller than 180 degrees. And it will always be smaller than 90. Okay, I can play the game of the smallest tile. I'll show them to you. It will be um, a tile that contains a white triangle and a colored one. 
and it will be replicated uh, all the way in all the the whole universe. Of course, the triangle change shape if we use our Euclidean eyes, but actually they can be rotated. For example, the white and the color can be moved to the white and the color here, and so on and so forth. So you can fill the whole space with this thing. So I played the game alone because it's a little tougher, and it points out to the fact that actually there are rotations and translations in the Poincaré disk. So what uh, was the woodcut I was talking about? Well, it's funny. Ether had dropped out of mathematics during high school. He was not very keen in studying mathematics. But um, he had problem also communicating with Coxeter. So his uh, reaction when he received uh, Coxeter's explanation of the, ash, the woodcut that I will show you in a second is the following one. I had an enthusiastic letter from Coxeter about my colored school of fish, which I sent him. Three pages of explanation of what I actually did. It's a pity that I understand nothing, absolutely nothing. So here's the famous circle tr limit tree that use hyperbolic geometry without uh, the artist knowing about really a lot about uh, hyperbolic geometry and mathematics. I'm going to overlap the tile that I drawn before only a few seconds to notice that if you ignore the color of the fishes, this tile here contains a full fish. Of course, the yellow fish has its uh, side here cut, but it's actually this part that's replicated in green. This part is cut, but it reappears here, and its cheek is are partially cut, but then they appear here. I'm going to remove uh, the the tiles because the drawing is absolutely superb. And um, I've read somewhere that uh, Escher only used three pa wood panel to print this thing. One for the black lines and the black eyes, one for the yellow fish, and for the green fish that are actually obtained simply by a rotation by 90 degrees. And the third one for the red that he painted after to get the blue fishes again after a rotation. I don't know if it's this uh, true story, but it's quite remarkable. And uh, if you look at the line of fish, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fishes uh, going along this line. It's quite uh, perfect. Okay. Going back to the very beginning of my talk, you recall translation and rotation. Here's the rotation of my original tiling. So there should be something similar for um, the, the hyperbolic tiling. So actually very, very quickly, that's advanced mathematics, so that stuff that not everybody will understand. But here, let me flash it quickly. The group of translation and rotation of the circle limit tree is a subgroup of what we call SU11, which is a subgroup of SL2. The SL2 is the simplest thing to define, is the two by two complex matrices that have determinant one. The SU11 is a lot more complicated. If you sandwich it, if you sandwich the uh, the matrix with one plus one and one minus one, by this these matrix that are belonging to S U one one with the dagger, you get the same matrix. The dagger is the transpose complex conjugate. 
and the action on the element of the disk is highly nonlinear, so it's complicated and forces you to go through a complex number. So if you have a point within the circle, you define the complex number x of i y from the two coordinates i and y that are real number. You use the matrix that are in the group with a z plus b and c z plus d. And you can show that if the point was within the, the universe, the denominator never is zero. And since this is a complex number, it has the real part and an imaginary part. And the real part is the first component of the new point and the imaginary part is the second component. Very advanced stuff, but to help you look at them, I'm going to uh, go over this slide. So this is a translation along the hor uh, horizontal diameter. Of course, uh, things that are do not belong to the horizontal diameter are disturbed, they are move, but they are still moving from right to left. Thank you. And uh, you see that there's big uh, yellow gap uh, on either side appearing. That's my laziness. I didn't uh, draw an infinite number of blue triangles. So at the end of this simulation, I'll ask Daniel to show you the other transformation, which is a rotation, not uh, of this at the center, but uh, slightly off center. Okay, so it's pretty clear which uh, point is left unchanged through the rotation. You see everything. And by the way, no distance is strong in this thing. Of course, if you follow a triangle through the rotation, it changes its shape with your Euclidean eye, but not with the hyperbolic um, eyes. It's actually this rotation is an isometry. All distances and angles are preserved as we rotate around the center point. Okay, I think that, uh, can you stop it and give me back my, as, do we see our, my screen now? So I had included my uh, uh, animation in my presentation, but uh, discussing with Daniel, it was easier to do that. So many thanks uh, for Stefan and Dan to help me uh, answer my questions. Here are my sources. Thank you for your attention. At the end of this, uh, all this information rolling down, you'll get the exercise that will be discussed and the uh, exercise period on Wednesday. Not all the exercise will be discussed. Some are very long, some are tough. And um, my, I asked the TA to be there, not to tell you the answer, only to uh, help you if you have difficulty. And the big idea is to have fun. So thank you for your attention. And I'm now open for questions. OK. So actually, the choice. Um, is a lot larger. Um, okay, so I can I'll I'll move back to triangles because you can tile with triangles with uh, any angles in the hyperbolic plane, any angles whose sum is less than one hundred one hundred eighty degrees. So joining these triangles, you could have something that's not uh, a square, nor a triangle, nor uh, an hexagon. 
So there's a lot more freedom in the hyperbolic geometry, indeed. The fact that you can uh, add, uh, you can use uh, uh, triangles with any type of angles is very surprising because in the plane, you cannot use triangle with angle 2 pi over 5. You can see that that's ruled out. You won't be able to uh, tile the whole plane with such a, a triangle. Actually, uh, yes, but uh, you see the, the hyperbolic uh, disk was defined by bending the lines. So usually we don't seek a representation like within the Poincaré disk. The Poincaré disk is, uh, is really wonderful because it helps you visualize things. But the next step in geometry, once we've done uh, geometry in three dimension of surfaces, the next step is to define an object that's a little more abstract called manifold and define uh, land and area on these objects and look at their curvature, the same thing as the sphere is curved. And actually the hyperbolic uh, this is also curved in a sense that I would have, I would need a lot more hours to define. But the next step is to uh, more abstract object that we cannot visualize because they, sometimes they define in three, four, five, whatever dimension. But uh, the all our visualization is developed in two and three dimensions. So the first step is really to master uh, Euclidean geometry, differential geometry of surfaces in, the, in 3D, and then to make the big uh, jump to abstract thinking. Thank you. Tough question. Um, well, it, the, the distance depends on the point. So, I need to go out a little bit out of uh, Euclidean geometry and use something that you, if you've uh, learned a little bit of calculus, is to uh, think of uh, uh, the length of, uh, of a curve in the hyperbolic plane as being visited uh, through, uh, with a given speed. And uh, you need coordinates. And, and and you need to be able to differentiate the coordinate along this line to measure the speed. And the speed will be weighted by some a factor that we know explicitly that increase as you move toward the horizon. So at the center, the, the fact the weight is about one. But as you move uh, towards the uh, the horizon, the way it becomes uh, very large. And at the horizon, which is not part of the universe, it's infinite. So it's a function of the distance from the center of the disk that uh, goes to infinity at the horizon. That's the best I can do with uh, without a blackboard and a little more differential geometry. Oh, this one, this one in Kilevit, uh, in the plane, you're right, it's totally useless. Um, so uh, if you would generalize to 3D Euclidean geometry, you would need uh, this uh, further uh, thing. But I didn't do it because in, in English because I realized that I had as in a plane. Ah, but the five prime doesn't say it's a prime, it's a plane. So I think my five prime is correct. So if you do 3D geometry and you define the line and you take a point out of the line, the fifth axiom would require the parallel to be in the plane defined by this line and the point. Okay. 
So I formulated the two axioms a little differently, but I think they're correct. Okay, so the, the answer is, I'm going to change your question to, uh, to say yes. So is there a, a deformation of the Poincaré disk onto the upper half plane that preserves lines into lines, angles into angles? And the answer is yes. There's no such a mapping from the disk to the full plane. But if you take only half of the plane, it works. And it's called, uh, the two objects are called isometric because all distances are, uh, if you do the transformation, the transform image uh, of a segment has the same length as the original segment within the disk. So the answer is no to your question, but almost you could have uh, gotten a yes using the half of the plane. Good question, actually. Yes, we can. That's a good question. And it's the first reflex that a mathematician would do. Is the 2D uh, an incredible, um, an incredible uh, coincidence? Or it's really uh, uh, something that, that works? Actually, um, there's quite a bit of example uh, of objects that have the same property of, uh, of um, similar property of the Poincaré disk. Uh, one family would be the, uh, the projective spaces that can be defined in any dimensions. And um, so objects that would have uh, non-compact, meaning um, you can have object uh, lines of infinite length, for example, in all directions, and um, a curvature that's uh, uh, identical at each point, but it's negatively curved. It's, it's a little difficult to uh, explain what negative curvature is when you're looking at the point I disk on the plane. But the short answer to your question is, yes, such object exists in all dimensions. I don't know much about it a lot. I think uh, if you go, uh, if you Google it, you'll see uh, similar things like that in 3D. So you'll be, uh, Part, uh, the, the way the representation are, it's you draw only the, the edges of the polyhedron that tiles the 3D object, the hyperbolic space. So there's either animation and I, there might be even program that's it, that you ask, uh, like on Google Map, go straight ahead and you see, the, you see yourself traveling within the tiling and you can even turn around. <laughs> I, I don't do, I don't play that much, but if you Google it, I think you'll have fun at least for 15 minutes. Um, there's good representation of, and I think there's video games where the action plays within the Poincaré disc. So um, you can learn a little bit the feeling of how, it, it, how things happen. So um, tiling of um, objects in uh, 2D, 3D, 4D are classified. By that, I mean you, there's a relationship between the groove that I talk once in a while about and the tiling. And uh, I think that Escher knew that in 2D, there was 17 of these groups, and actually he drew uh, tilings representing the 17 of them. So instead of classifying or drawing actual tilings, 
mathematician, I've been interested in classifying what we call crystallographic group in 2D. 2D is known since the 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, 3D a little after, and the four-dimensional classification has been done in the 90s, the 1990s, so the 90s of the last century. So it's a, an interesting question. I don't know if 5D was done. I don't know if there would be any use uh, of having such a classification, I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, if we have a second Escher, it wouldn't be interested in doing 5D, that's for sure. 